Great. So, um, first of all, thanks everyone for attending. I'm blown away by how many people are here and share my enthusiasm for the immune system. It's great to see. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about um, some work that I've been doing on autoimmune disease. So, you've heard a little bit about autoimmune disease already. Um, so, it's really an umbrella term for a group of over 100 diseases um, and affects as a whole group of diseases, it affects about one in eight Australians. Um, so there's the more common autoimmune diseases such as um, rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes that you've probably heard of. Um, but then there's the, the less common um, diseases as well that fall, in, fall into that banner such as neonatal lupus. So autoimmune disease represents a major challenge to us at the moment because these really large group of diseases um, are incurable and the treatments that are available um, are really not up to standard um, at the moment. So they're quite, they're inadequate, they've um, got several side effects and it's mainly because they lack specificity. So they tend to dampen the whole immune system and we've just learned today how important the immune system is. So you can understand that reducing the whole immune system um, has quite an effect on these people. And it's actually costing um, our healthcare system twice that of cancer because these people need to stay on these treatments for the rest of their life. And there's also the ongoing monitoring that's involved um, with, with these particular diseases. So I think really the best way that I can think to explain autoimmune disease, because it is such a diverse group of diseases, um, is to talk about a, a young woman that I met um, with the autoimmune disease, lupus. So lupus is really prototypical of a lot of autoimmune diseases. It can affect several different organ systems. Um, and as Chris mentioned earlier in his talk, it involves often a long diagnostic journey for these patients. So I'm not a clinician. I don't see patients. I'm a scientist. Um, but I was really fortunate to um, meet Laura about three years ago when I first started working for Garvin. Um, she was holding a lupus fundraiser event. Um, so Laura was um, a 19-year-old uni student um, and she first presented with fever and just really tired all the time. And she um, was going to her doctor and she initially thought she had the flu but eventually her fatigue just got so much that she couldn't go on with normal things in life. She um, couldn't stay at uni, she just um, beyond having the flu. She then developed um, severe swelling of her feet, um, hands and legs and she thought um, she'd gained a lot of weight and she thought it was to do with the inactivity as well but there was a lot of moisture, um, water gathering in her feet and legs and um, it wasn't until her kidneys began to deteriorate that she was diagnosed with lupus nephritis. Um, so this was probably a good year after she had developed the fever and the fatigue that she finally got a diagnosis and she was immediately put on um, high dose steroids for the purpose of dampening her immune system. But this um, was not effective and she was um, given chemotherapy which is another um, way of suppressing the immune system which happens in autoimmune disease. And this actually improved her kidney function. Um, but as a result of this therapy, um, she suffered ovarian failure and was um, deemed infertile. So I think um, Laura's case and the reason I present this case is because it's really um, indicative of a lot of autoimmune diseases in that the therapies are just not effective um, and the side effects are quite severe, particularly for young adults. So clearly there's a lot more work to do um, and Laura's case is not unlike the two to three million Australians that are currently living with autoimmune disease where the treatments are ineffective. To be a glass half full kind of person, um, if you look at the survival rates of people diagnosed with lupus, um, 50 years ago someone diagnosed um, with lupus at Laura's age would have only had a 50% chance of making it to their 40th birthday. 
So we've come we've come a long way with immunotherapy, sorry, with um, immunosuppressive therapies and those sorts of things. But now it's really about the quality of life. And one of the things that stuck with me that Laura mentioned was that she was always um, had that concern about if her kidneys failed again, um, if, her, if her treatment stopped working. So um, this is really a real challenge that we're dealing with. And I think it's highlighted by the fact that for lupus and a lot of autoimmune diseases, in the last 50 years, there's actually only been one drug approved. So there's really an unmet need in this area. So really the purpose of my research and what I'm trying to do here um, and our team collectively, is really first and foremost to improve the diagnostic tests for autoimmune disease. We really need a better way and an earlier way to be able to pick up when a patient's immune system is starting to, um, to um, work against itself. So if we can reduce the time to diagnosis, I think we can really reduce um, the amount of organ damage that's done. The second... Um, goal of my research is really to come up with safer and more effective therapies, so less side effects, um, and really to try to understand the cause of disease so that we can treat the cause of autoimmune disease rather than just the symptoms as they occur. And finally, um, also autoimmune disease, more than a lot of other diseases, is something that would really benefit from personalised treatment. Every patient looks so different. Um, and so I think we can really try to um, get some access to this genomic approaches to really improve um, using um, new therapies. So one of the um, great things about autoimmune disease at the moment is there are new biologics that are becoming available. Um, but again, the clinicians are really struggling with trying to understand which patients those are going to work for. So, We've, we're working on what we feel is really a groundbreaking idea here at Garvin, um, and that is really trying to understand the cells that have gone rogue. So we're proposing that autoimmune diseases, all autoimmune diseases, have the same underlying cause, and that's a group of cells in the immune system that have gone rogue and started attacking healthy parts of the body. And we think this is happening because these rogue cells have acquired what we're calling bad mutations in their DNA. So um, you saw talks before about checkpoints and things that are in the body that are in place to prevent the immune system from going out of control. And we think that there's actually mutations in these different areas um, that are allowing these cells, when they should be dampened down, to proliferate and have a survival advantage almost like a lymphoma. So we propose that if we can target the cells that have gone rogue um, and actually specifically reduce these cells or take these cells out, that we can treat autoimmune disease in a much more specific and safer way. So we're embarking here on a really exciting program at Garvin called the HOPE Research Program where we're actually going to look at 36 different autoimmune diseases. And we're going to study the cells um, that we believe have gone rogue and are actually causing the autoimmune disease and look for links in these different diseases um, and at the same time look at different therapeutic options. So I'm going to run through um, an example of the, um, our first disease that we've actually started with has been Sjogren's syndrome. The reason we started with Sjogren's syndrome is this um, autoimmune disease has an increased risk of developing a cancer. Um, so we thought this would be a good one to start for looking for mutations. So it gets to the question, how do we actually find rogue clones? If you take um, a blood sample from a patient, it's full of all kinds of cells. And of course, the immune cells we're interested in are the white blood cells. Um, but we've got millions of these, and it's very difficult to find which ones are the rogue cells. So we've actually um, developed technology here um, where we actually look at single cells one at a time. So this has really taken 
a real shift in the technology that we're using to be able to do this. So conventionally, you'll do a DNA test on somebody and you'll take their blood and it contains a whole group of white blood cells. And the DNA that you get from that is an average of all of those cells. So if you have one rogue cell in there, the message can be lost. Um, the information from this one cell can get lost in all of that. Unlike cancer where most of the cells, or the majority of the cells will be rogue, it's a lot easier to get the signal. But autoimmune disease, the rogue cells are a lot less frequent, so it's a lot more difficult. So what we've turned to is doing single cell sequencing where we can actually get the individual information from each cell. This allows us to identify the rogue cell uh, and bad mutations in that cell. And really, the main questions we're asking in each of these 36 autoimmune diseases is what is different about this rogue cell compared to all these other cells? With the ultimate goal of eliminating this one cell but preserving all the rest of the cells, which are probably doing good things like um, fighting infections. So this is the first patient that we have looked at, um, a lady with Sjogren's syndrome. And I show this information because I think it really demonstrates um, how low a frequency these rogue cells were in this patient. So this is looking at all of her B cells, um, shown in grey here. These are her normal immune cells. And then this tiny little section here is this rogue clone, which actually develops in this patient, increases slightly, um, over time. But what we find here is that in 2011 she had quite mild symptoms even though we can still detect this rogue clone. As the rogue clone increases in frequency her disease symptoms also increase. But the reason this is particularly exciting to me is I think there's a window of opportunity here in 2011 that if we can find this clone we could treat back here before her symptoms actually develop or become worse. And so obviously we need to look at this in a lot more patients, but if we can find signals or particular signatures that associate with these rogue cells and those that are likely to cause organ damage, we can actually eradicate them quite early. So this is quite a complicated slide. Um, but I thought I would put it up really to demonstrate the power of this single cell sequencing that, we've, that we have here available at Garvin. So what you're actually looking at is a map. This is a gene map of these cells. So on the left, you've got a whole bunch of cells, normal immune cells in this patient. And on the right, you've got all of her rogue cells and we've sorted them according to their, their mutations. So each little square is an individual cell and each row is a gene. So these are the names of the genes listed down the side here. And where you see yellow or red, it means the gene is switched on. When you see blue, it means the gene is switched off. So the take home message here is that these rogue immune cells have a lot more genes that are switched on. They're a lot more activated. But what we do, we spend a long time going through this these lists of genes looking for differences, trying to work out what is different between these rogue cells and these normal cells and how can we use this information to help the patient. So if I just zoom in here on this row, um, we found this gene called CD86. So you can see here it's switched, in, switched on on most of these rogue cells here and virtually switched off or lowered in the normal cells. So there's actually a drug available that blocks CD86 um, and is currently being used in clinical trials for Sjogren's syndrome. So we're thinking that this might be a good candidate, this drug for this particular patient. This drug's been showing mixed res results so far. Some patients it's worked in, some patients it hasn't worked in. But we think if we can look at these rogue cells, we might be able to have a more rational way of being able to determine what drug is going to work in what patient. So um, also looking at our bad mutations, this is the way we look at DNA. Each one of these peaks does mean something. It, it's the code of the DNA. Um, and what we found here in the rogue cells um, was they contain this mutation here. 
So when we went back to our gene list and annotated what this mutation actually meant, um, we found that it was the exact same mutation that's been found in several cases of um, lymphoma and leukaemia. So all the great things that are happening with um, cancer immunotherapy at the moment, we're really excited because we think we might be able to apply that to autoimmune disease um, and ask the broader questions, do the mutations that drive lymphomas and drive cancers also drive these rogue cells in autoimmune disease? And if this is the case, it'll open up um, opportunities for immunotherapy, being able to target similar um, drugs to, to autoimmune disease as what we're currently using um, for lymphomas. So um, I'll just summarise basically what we're doing here. Um, really trying to improve um, diagnostic tests for autoimmune disease. We think we can track rogue clones in patients and um, we've already shown in a few of our patients now that they can be an early marker of disease activity. So the idea is that we can track these rogue clones early, find what, um, what they're doing, what they're expressing. We can really characterise these rogue clones, come up with more safer and effective therapies that specifically take out the clone um, while preserving the rest of the immune system. So I just acknowledge the group that does, um, has been working on these rogue cells. It's been a real team effort. We also have collaborators outside of Garvin as well, um, a group of clinicians and scientists that are really working together to try to understand the underlying cause of autoimmune disease. So that's it from me and thank you for your attention.